and our topic is the deception of riches. Psalm 49, we'll start by reading the verse, the, the passage. Psalm 49, hear this all ye people, give ear all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. I will incline mine ear to a parable, I will open my, uh, open my dark sayings upon the heart. Wherefore should I fear the days in the days of evil, when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, they bring in honor, and nevertheless men being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. There is their, this their way is their folly. Yet their prosperity, approve, their posterity approve their sayings. Stay long. Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. Stay long. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich. When the glory of his house is increased, for when he dieth, he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the grave. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perisheth. The deception of riches. Now tonight we're going to break this passage down into five sections. The first is verses 1 through 4, which would be a preface. Verses 1 through 4, a preface to the whole psalm. Verses 5 through 12, the fear is removed. Verses 5 through 12, the fear is removed. Then verse 13 is a, a wonder at the continued, at continued folly. Verse 13, wonder at continued folly. Folly. Verse 14 and 15 is a contrast, a contrast the ungodly and the righteous. And then verses 16 through 20, a lesson is given. So verses 1 through 4 is a preface. 5 through 12, fear is removed. 13, uh, we'll wonder at the continued folly. 14 and 15, contrast the ungodly and the righteous. And 16 through 20, the lesson is taught, the lesson is given. So our first section is the preface. Verses 1 through 4, there's a preface. You know, it says here in the passage, hear this all ye people. And it says all people should listen to this saying. This is an important saying. It's applicable to all people, all groups, every person. And notice he begins to uh, list them low and high, rich and poor together. The old and the young, the rich and the poor. The wise and the unwise all should hear this parable, this uh, story that he's about to tell because it's so important that he wants the world to know and he wants the world to listen up. This is wisdom. Everyone is affected by what he's about to say. Everyone's affected in some way, either by becoming rich or by being affected by those who do become rich. He says riches are a deception. Riches are a deception. Here he says that to listen up, everyone, rich and poor, all ye people, give ye all ye inhabitants of the world. Everybody needs to hear this because in the preface he points out this is the most important thing that you all need to listen to at this time he's going to teach us. And so we find that uh, he says, my mouth shall speak of wisdom and the meditations of my heart shall be of understanding. He's going to speak inspired of the Holy Spirit. You know, our scriptures are inspired of God. The Psalms are inspired. David wrote most of them. And David has written them uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to understand what that word means, inspiration. It means God breathed. And God gave 
the words to David as he wrote them down. These are the very words God wanted written down. He didn't just give him ideas and then David wrote them down and he had God's ideas with man's words. God did use men and he did use their personality and their instrumentality and he did use their um, different and unique experiences. But every single word, in fact, Jesus says every single jot and every single tittle of the Bible is of the inspired word of God. And those are the smallest marks in the book. And so we have the inspired word of God. We have the message from heaven in our book. And that's what he says, I'm going to open my mouth and I'm going to speak wisdom. Not his own wisdom, but the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And so he begins to use not only his Word, his mouth, but he also uses the harp and he sings and he puts the song, to, he puts the wisdom to music. And I want to encourage you to remember that our songs are important and our songs should be doctrinally sound. And we are in a um, scourge today in the church in which there's a lot of doctrinally unsound writers of music, writers of songs, and they're giving them to the church. In fact, the majority of the praise and worship music that's used in churches today is written by the uh, Pentecostal and charismatic crowd, and they are not known to be doctrinally sound. They emphasize feeling and emotions and, and experiences over doctrine, and they are going to be the ones who produce most of the music that is given to the church to sing in the praise and worship leader by the praise and worship leaders in their uh, song, uh, song time for worship. And so we need to recognize that sound, songs that are doctrinally unsound should not be a part of the church. You know, you can trace what the church believed by the music that they sang. And if we introduce songs with bad doctrine into the church, then we will become under the impression that that is correct doctrine. And it's not. And so we can look backwards and see that the, for the majority of the uh, songs that we sang and chose as a church, they were doctrinally sound, and we ought to maintain doctrinal purity in our songs. And if a song is not doctrinally sound, it doesn't matter if it's a hymn or if it's any other kind of song. It doesn't uh, exempt it from being kicked out of our songs if it's not doctrinally sound. We should sing good songs. We should sing good songs, and that's, he says he's going to use song to teach the, uh, to teach the people. So now we get into the second section, verses 5 through 12, and uh, he is going to remove the fear of oppressors by a remembrance of their end. He's going to remove the fear, the fear of the oppressor, and he says in verse 4, excuse me, 5, Wherefore should I fear in the day of evil, when iniquity of my heels shall compass me about? He says, I'm going to, why, why should I be afraid? There's going to be a time when it's going to get bad. There's going to be a time when there's going to be trouble, but why should I be afraid? You are going to have trouble, and there is going to be a time for fear. But he says, why should I be afraid? And he says, verse 6, they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. He says, why should I be afraid if the rich come after me? The fears are going to be allayed, but the temptation is going to be real. There's going to be a real temptation to fear. There's going to be a real temptation to be concerned. And they have, the rich do have power. They have influence. And they have the uh, ability to uh, affect us. They have the ability to oppress us. They have the ability to take our wealth. They have the ability to uh, make our lives more difficult. They have the ability to interfere with our business. The, the wealthy and the powerful have the ability to make our lives miserable. But why should I be afraid if my God is bigger than that? Why should I be afraid if my God controls all of the cattle on a thousand hills, is rich, as uh, owns all of the gold that there is? Why should I be afraid if my God is in charge? I should not fear them. They can do to me what they must, but they cannot take my soul from me. They cannot steal from me my security in Christ. They cannot steal my good conscience and my love for God. But we see here that he says, essentially, why should I fear? And here is the reasoning and the argument. And he says, essentially, uh, let's see, we'll look in verse 7. None of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. Look in verse uh, verse 9, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. The argument essentially goes like this. 
Why should I fear when we can look and see that death is a great equalizer? Death is the great equalizer. It reduces men of wealth and poor men down to the same essentials. There you are in a box, in a hole in the ground, poor and rich alike. No more money, no more influence, no more power, no more ability to affect any other man. Death reduces all men to an equal position, naked and destitute before God. Death reduces all people to the same position. And so we find here that he says, essentially, that by your riches, you cannot deliver yourself from death. By your riches, you cannot forestall death. You cannot put it off. Though you may feel like you will live forever, you will not. Though you may feel like you will um, be able to purchase immortality with your money, you will not. I think it was, uh, um, I'm trying to remember, uh, Ted Williams. He was a baseball player. And he uh, put his body in what's called cryogenics, I think. I think he used his money for that. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean... Don't quote me on that. I, I could be completely wrong. But if I remember correctly, Ted Williams had his body frozen so that if for some day, some somehow they would be able to find some sort of cure for whatever he had, they would be able to revive him and fix him. And then he could live again. But let me tell you, no matter how much money Ted Williams has, there's no cure for death. There, the, science is not going to come up with a cure for death. If you died, you met the Lord. And after that is the judgment, and then you'll, you have met your final end, and all things are over for you. You will not live again uh, in this life, in, a, in the same life you had before. Science will not revive you. You will not be able to come back. God has taken over. Man has gone to the great place of equal, being equalized all together. And so they stand before God having their riches taken from them, and they stand before God, unable to purchase their soul. It is a precious thing to have life. It's a precious thing to be able to buy your life and pay for longer years, but it cannot be done with any amount of money. So why fear them? He, we see, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 10, he says, For he seeth that the wise die, likewise the fool, and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. You know, it's uh, something that every person is recognizing that they uh, that people die. Uh, people die. He says in verse 10, he seeth that the wise men die, likewise the fool. You know, you look around on you know, the rich. They look around. They see that the wise men they die. The foolish man he also dies. The rich man dies. The poor man dies. And so, recognizing these truths. Uh, they recognize that um, all of their money is going to be gone. All of their riches are going to pass on to the next person. Nevertheless, verse 12, man being in honor abideth not. Uh, he, oh, excuse me, verse 11. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. See, they're trying to face immortality head on and they're trying to make themselves immortal. And they say, well, we know that everybody's going to die, so I'm going to put my name upon my land, and, and it's going to be like I live forever. But you know, who are those people who lived two generations ago with all the money, with all the power, with all the influence? They don't have any effect upon us. We don't remember their names. We don't remember who they are. There might be a few folks with their names on a few buildings or their names on a few endeavors that we recall, but they are gone, and they're gone forever. And that is what he's saying here. Their inward thought is that they're going to pass on their, their heritage and they're going to last and, and they're going to continue to influence people, but it's just not the case. They still die and they're still left. And in verse 12, nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perisheth. They find that they pass away just like everyone else. They die and they pass away like, the, like an animal. And they leave everything they have to someone else, no matter how much money they have. Then we have verse 13, this wonder at continued folly. Verse 13, he says, this their way is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings. You know, this is foolishness to think that somehow your money is going to deliver you in the time of death. That your money is going to be the answer. That your money is a substitute for God. That your money is an end. 
but to everybody who's alive can see that you are going to die. No matter how much money you have, you're going to die. And you know what? All the people who are not as rich and who aren't as wealthy, they still look at that person and they approve of what they're doing. They approve of it. And they, it says, verse 13 here, this their posterity approve their sayings. Their, their posterity look up to them. And we look up to rich people and people who are like uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and these people who have uh, billions of dollars and they've made so much money for themselves. And we look at them and we approve of their sayings as people. We look up to them and, and respect them for their wealth and their money. And they're going to die like the rest of us. They're going to die, and they're going to die just like everybody else. In fact, Steve Jobs did die. He died young, and there's nothing he could do about it for all the money he had. And so we find that uh, the world approves it. They still approve it even though they know they're going to die, and they approve of uh, they, they, what they're approving of is, is this philosophy that money is a, uh, and money is a deliverer. Money is a savior. And then we get to this, the, the fourth portion, 14 through 15. And he contrasts the wicked, the ungodly, and the righteous. He says, Likewise, they are laid in the grave, and death shall feed on them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. He shall receive me. I want you to remember this, that the rich are going to be laid into the grave. And when they do are laid into the grave, death will consume them. And there is a morning coming for the righteous. A day in which the righteous will prevail. A day in which the righteous will be granted an opportunity to see the, the, the fruit of all of their troubles, see the fruit of all their prayers, see the fruit of all their patience, and their patience will be rewarded. And praise God, there'll be a day in which your money will not be how, the, how the, your company respects you. Your money will not be how the, uh, the, the party in which you, you are in uh, looks up to you or sees, uh, sees you as important. It will be your holiness, your likeness to Christ. There'll be a crowd of people who looks up to you or looks at you at least and judges you according to your beauty, your real beauty, true, genuine beauty that you look like Jesus Christ. And they will look at you, and they'll see the glory of Christ in you, and they will be, uh, they'll be, they'll praise God for you. And they will thank Him for all He's done for you in your life. They'll thank Him for the time that He uh, delivered you from temptation, and He helped you through your trials and troubles, and He made you like unto Himself, and He saved you from hell, and He put you on your way to heaven and changed your life. And they will look at you, and they'll see the likeness of Christ in you, and they will look up to you. They will... Be, they'll be um, enamored by your beauty because of the most beautiful, genuine, real thing that will last forever and eternity. There's a morning coming for the children of God, the righteous, but for the rich, for those who are trusting in their riches, they will not be redeemed from the power of the grave. They will not be redeemed from the power of the grave. They will not be received by God. The Bible says that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because he trusts in his riches. And when we see people who are talk about their riches, uh, we ought to be have a red flag go off in our minds that it doesn't matter if you are rich uh, or how rich you are, your money is not going to buy you any um, uh, any respect in the eyes of God. Okay. Your uh, your money's not going to buy you any respect in the eyes of God. And if it won't buy you respect in the eyes of God, it ought not to buy you respect in the eyes of His people either. We ought not to respect someone just because they're rich, because they have lots and lots of money. And the book of James tells us to be very careful when someone comes into your congregation and they have money and you give them a front seat and you pay attention to them and dote on them because they have wealth. And then someone comes in as poor and you say, well, you sit in the back. Why? You just uh, take this back seat because you don't have the money and, and we're going to make sure that the person has all this riches that they uh, come in and, and they're treated with such rich respect. The Bible says that's a hypocrisy and you ought not to do that. So he contrasts the righteous and the wicked. Now if we look in verse 16, we'll see that he teaches. He teaches and he teaches this lesson. And he te starts in verse 16. Be thou not afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house has increased. He says, do not fear the rich. You know, you ought not to fear 
the rich because the rich are just mortal men and they are not able to judge you in the last day. Only Jesus can judge you and therefore do not be afraid of the mortal man though he increase in his wealth. And he says in verse 17, For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. When he dies, everything that he has is going to remain here. He's not going to take it with him. He will not have any honors or titles in the next life. He won't have the uh, your honor, or he won't have the uh, the uh, the honorable and, and powerful, or sir, or this or that, any of those titles in the next life. He won't be taking those titles or those honors or those um, that money with him. It will all be left here behind, here on this side. In verse 18, though while he lived, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. You know, people are apt to praise the wealthy. They're likely to give to the wealthy an undue amount of praise. Now, why is that? I'll tell you, it's because most people would like to be rich. They, you know, people say, oh, you don't want to be rich. There's so many problems and headaches. And people will say, I wouldn't mind having your headaches for a few days. Uh, the, 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 the picture in the minds of us is that if I had money, I'd be more comfortable. And if I had more comfort in this life, I would be happier. But the truth is, and as it says here, that people approve and people will say that you're doing great if you've made money. But God says, you glorify me and you don't lust after money. Don't chase the dollar signs. Don't be, just don't desire to become rich because it will pierce you through with many sorrows. Be careful if you are going to chase after money, you will be disappointed that in the end, all you have had is more trouble for what it was worth. The money will not make you happy. The money will not make you Christ-like. Money cannot do those things. It is not wrong to have money, and if God blesses you with it, it is a wonderful thing, and you should use it for his glory, but it is not for a Christian to chase money. It's for a Christian to chase heaven. It's for a Christian to be like Christ, and it's for a Christian to deny himself and give and live for Christ, and that ought to be the objective of a Christian. But the world will say, if you chase after money, that you've done well. You've done a good thing. And, you know, we ought to be careful when we raise our children not to send them to a college for the purpose of having a good career. That is not the objective of education, so that they'll go out and make a lot of money. The objective of education is the same as the objective of every other aspect of parenting, and that is to make them a, a godly child who can function well in the kingdom of God. And if that means that they're a, a poor individual who works a trade who does not ever make a lot of money, but they're where God wants them, we have to be happy with that. Uh, if it means that they have a career, then that is um, a high-paying career, but that's where God wants them. We ought to be happy for that. So we ought not to send them just to, off to a college in order to get a good degree where they can make a lot of money. You need to be careful to realize college is not just about going there and making some sort of career for yourself so you can be rich. It's about be, being prepared to serve the Lord. So just a, a note. The world would say that's the purpose of your life, is to grow up, get rich, make a lot of money, learn to have a good career so you can make it in life. And that is not the case. Verse 19. He shall go to the generation of his fathers, they shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perisheth. You know, it's a sad fun finality to this hymn, this psalm, this hymn, but he says essentially that man... He doesn't understand the principles that I've just laid down is no better than an animal. He's going to go down into the grave and he's going to die just like an animal. Don't be like an animal. Be like a child of God. Don't be like an animal. Be like a man who recognizes that there's a God in heaven who's going to judge him for how he lives in this life. That all of his thoughts and actions and behavior should be geared towards pleasing the Lord. And that your money is not something for you to chase after. It, it is something for you to use for the kingdom of God. And be careful to have, to have understanding in this area. Recognizing when money gets a hold of you, when the desire to have wealth grabs hold of you, when you are unwilling to uh, part with that money because it is uh, something that we grasp onto or we chase it and we sacrifice family or important things, church, and other things in order to have the money, 
be careful that money doesn't take over. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that perisheth. Sad, sad ending. Don't let that sad ending be you. Be a child of God who gives all that they have to the Lord. First consecrates it all to God and then lives to please the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this night. We thank you that you've given us from your word the message that money is not the great object. We're not to serve mammon. We're to serve God. We're to serve the Lord Jesus. And we're to please you in all things. God, I would ask that you would deliver us from the desire to be rich. And I also ask that you pay our bills and help us to live for you and provide all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen.